There is a popular phrase, and the phrase goes like this, as go the men, um, goes the family, and as goes the family, goes the neighborhood, and as goes the neighborhood, goes the city, and as goes the city, goes the state, and so on. And that phrase rings true as well for the church. So when the men of the church are faithful and their families become faithful and they become faithful to the church, the church benefits, the church grows. And as the church benefits, the the community, the, the people around the world benefits as well. And the adverse is true. So when the men are not faithful to lead the way that God calls them to lead and the families are not faithful to participate in what God calls them to, and then the church suffers. And when the church suffers, ultimately the community, the world suffers. We're not able to do what God has called us to do. And and that line of thinking kind of guides what Paul is talking to young Titus about here in chapter 2. He's giving, um, Paul is giving Titus this list of specialized instructions to these different groups in the church. And it ranges from those who are older to those who are younger to uh, homemakers and to business leaders. And the things that Paul says to Titus here are particular to that culture there in Crete. But as we've seen in so many other places in the scripture, the things that are particular to that culture tend to bleed into our culture as well. But before we dive into these instructions in chapter 2, let's look at how Paul frames all of this for Titus. We left off last week at the end of uh, chapter 1, verse 16, and, and Paul is talking about these people who confess to know God, but they deny him by the way that they live. They were led more by the opinions of man than they were by the commands of God. And we all know that it's, it's one thing to say something about your life, it's a whole other thing to actually live it. There's a commentary that speaks to this section. It says this, If our lifestyle fails to reflect the character of God, then we neutralize our testimony. And because of this, the rest of this epistle shows that the gospel or sound doctrine places moral obligations on all believers, regardless of their age or station in life. The Christian's duty and usefulness lies exactly in not outside of the circumstances under which his life is lived. And so Paul uses this as the hinge, really, to open up the rest of the book to this. So uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 1. Paul speaking to Titus here. He says, but as for you... Teach what accords with sound doctrine. So here's the contrast that Paul's making. We just got done talking about these people who say one thing but live another. And Paul says, but as for you, Titus, it's got to be different with you. Teach what accords with. In other words, teach what fits with sound or healthy doctrine. And and what's healthy doctrine is, is what's true about Jesus. We call it the gospel, the good news about who Jesus is, what he has done, what he promises to finish. And the gospel gives us unique perspectives. It allows us to look back on uh, just the glory of God and, and what he has done. It allows us to, to look at the price that he paid for our rebellion, our sin. It allows us to look forward to the finished work of what God is making us to be. And Paul says, teach what is an appropriate response to those truths, those realities. Now, it's really important, too, before we get into a list of things that God that God calls us to do, that we really understand the root of where all these things come from. It's found in verse 11. So if you just look down in your text, for the grace of God has appeared. So everything in our lives is to be reshaped by our experience of this grace, the gospel of Jesus. You see, following Jesus, being a Christian, is not just a a to-do list of things that we need to work harder on or a bunch of morals to master. It's a response to God's unearned, undeserved, and truly amazing favor. Christianity is a fundamentally an all-of-life response to God's amazing grace. And what Paul is telling young Titus and us, I believe, this morning is how that response translates into our everyday living. And, and he speaks to each age group, and he speaks to them about particular temptations that tend to be specific to those groups. So look at verse 2. Older men, we start with you. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in 
steadfastness. Now, when he speaks to older men, he's talking primarily about those who are further along, further along in age, but also further along in experience, further along in faith as well. And he says, be sober-minded or be, be sound in your mind. Be sober in the truth. Don't let other influences distract your mind. When, when you're drunk, your mind is influenced usually towards a pattern of behavior that you're eventually going to regret, but also towards more drunkenness. And what Paul is saying, be sober and sound in the truth. Don't let your mind be influenced. Don't let your mind be drunk on outside influences. Be self-controlled. This is a key phrase in, in, this, uh, in this section here. So if you're a highlighter, writer, person, you can highlight that word. You see it several times. And, and, and Paul's saying, make sound decisions and, and live for the right things because you're solid in your faith. Be self-controlled because you're solid in your confidence of who God is, what he's done, and what he's going to do. Be, be, be self-controlled because you're sound in your love, your self-sacrificing, laying your life down for others. Be, be sound in your steadfastness. It means that you weather the storms of life. You're not tossed around by circumstances. You're not tossed around by, by culture. And Paul says those things make up a self-controlled man. Uh, now, a lot of what Paul says to the older men, he's going to repeat to the other groups, but there's one thing in particular that he says to them, and he says, Titus, you need to teach them this idea of endurance and steadfastness. Your version might say perseverance. Because Paul knows the temptation in that day and the temptation in our day as well is for older men when they get to kind of the last third of their life to just kind of mail the rest in to coast, right? They've made all the money that they're going to make or they're, they just kind of quit trying to make money and they're, they're tired. They're, not, they're, they're too tired to serve. They don't really um, think about kind of pursuing anything else in that realm. They just want to kind of live for themselves and pursue their own hobbies and pursue their own interests. Um, and, and then they tend to get grumpy and, and cynical. None of the old men around here, but it happens. Um, they get grumpy or cynical because they become self-absorbed. And what Paul says, look, tell those guys to stay in the game. Tell those guys to endure. Tell them, don't think of your own needs, but think of the needs of the kingdom. Think of the needs of the church and the next generation. He says, don't teach them not to spend their last years on themselves, but to invest them for the sake of the kingdom of God. And I understand, I, I work primarily um, with young adults, so ages 18 to 30 or, or so, um, and so I understand that it's easy to be critical, critical of the generations that come after yours. I also know that it's been happening forever. Older men have always looked at younger men and shake their head, and to be fair, younger men have always looked up at older men and shake their head. It's always been happening. But, but, but here's something that we have to remind, re, be reminded of. God resurrected Jesus from the dead. His promises and his work in your generation and in my generation and in the generations to come will not be thwarted. Paul's not saying, older man, I need you to put your faith in the younger generation. What he's saying is be sound in your confidence of who God is and encourage the younger men, the younger generations, by your faith, by that confidence in God. I, I've often wondered, you know, I, so the, we showed a video last week for summer camp and the, and the kids who go to summer camp, but they get so fired up about who God is and what he is doing. I, I've often wondered, what if the older men in our churches had that same kind of passion, had that same kind of zeal for who God is and what he was doing? If we weren't looking at the students to lead the charge in that, but if the older men said, I have seen what God has done, I've experienced more of what God has done, his promises become more and more real to me every day. I'm fired up. What would it look like if our churches were led with men like that? And it's not just optimism. It's faith. It's trusting that God truly is the God of immeasurably more. He's that God in your generation. He's that God in generations to come. My life, I, I, I'm really excited that I get to teach this passage, actually, because my life has been tremendously impacted by the investment that older men have made in my life. I've got about four guys, four consistent guys in this church, and, and, and it's not that these guys have always necessarily believed the best about me, but they've always believed that Jesus is better, and they teach me what that means. 
And, and these guys, these four guys, they share their lives with me. They share their wins and their losses. They share the grace that's bigger than both of those things that covers them, that covers me. They, they, they share with me in a way that makes me want to love Jesus more, that, that grows a desire in me to be the man of God that God calls me to be. And, and it's not the sermons that they've taught. It's not a book that they gave me to read. You see, Paul doesn't use the word preach here. He doesn't say, Titus, te- tell, tell the older men to go preach at all the young men. He, he, he says, talk to them about the truth in natural conversations as you go through your life together. So, so, so you're teaching to young men, older, older men. It, it doesn't have to be in a formal setting but, because the best type of teaching happens in the context of, other, of everyday life. These men, these men in the church that pour into me, it happens uh, in very natural settings. They share truth with me over a meal, uh, working on my truck, uh, shooting guns, hiking a mountain, camping. It sounds like a very macho list. It, it, I'm not that macho. You can go to the mall and talk about truth. It doesn't really matter. It's just the idea that you are spending your life together um, and you're taking them through that. And this is the way that God talks about this instruction being passed down. He he says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. This is was a Hebrew way of, of teaching. God's principles being allowed to permeate all of life. You're talking truth as you're going through life. This was the way that Jesus taught his disciples or his followers as they were walking along, as they were going through life. He would point out things. Look at this. This is how truth applies to that. This is how love applies to that. And so if you're an older man in this church, don't give up on the younger men. I, again, I'm, I'm with them all the time, and despite their, their struggles, their shortcomings, which, by the way, every generation has their own flavor of, I'm incredibly hopeful of what God can do in and through them because of who God is. There's a story in the Bible of a man named Cable, Caleb, sorry, uh, I just made up a guy. Um, <laughs> Caleb. I actually really love the story of Caleb. Um, Caleb was one of the original 12 spies that was sent out during the Exodus to spy spy on the promised land. So God said to his people, look, I've got this land all picked out for you. Just go get it. And uh, so the Israelites, the the people of God, they send these 12 spies out uh, and they go. And 10 of the 12 spies said, "Uh, no way. Land's too big, too many warriors. There's no way that we can take that land. Um, uh, well, there's, there's no way we can conquer it. But there were two spies, one named Joshua, one la- named Caleb. And they said, uh, look, I know the giants are big, but God is bigger. So let's go get that land. But what happened, unfortunately, is that the people of God listened to the other 10 spies. And then that meant that the people of God, the Israelites, they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. And during that 40 years, every one of that generation died off, including Moses. And then, and, and then at the end of that, The only two people out of that generation to make it out were Joshua and Caleb, and Caleb is about 85 years old at the time. They cross the Jordan River, they have this battle at Jericho, and the first thing they encounter is this huge mountain, this huge mountain that's covered with all these warriors, and Caleb says, you know what, that's my mountain. God promised that mountain, that's mine, I'm I'm, I'm taking it. And he did, he conquered that mountain. And I love that story, and here's why. Because that's a picture of a guy who understands that the promises of God have not expired. And that they are as real at 85 years old as they are at 25 years old. And what God is saying to us is that we have even more reason to understand the steadfastness, the faithfulness of God's promise than Caleb did. Because we have the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which speaks a greater word about the power of his kingdom than any critique or shortcoming or struggle or failure of any generation. And it ensures us that any life that is lived for the kingdom of God will not be wasted. We need more men. We need older men like this who can play that role in this church. We need older men who will mentor younger men. We need older men who are going to serve with kids and serve with students and serve with young adults and go on mission trips, who are going to be generous and who are going to be hospitable, who don't see discipleship as a young man's game or something that we just pay a couple pastors to do. We need, we need these older men who are going to get in the game, stay in the game. Um, we have a, a redemption community, those are our small groups um, for 710 for, for the young adults. And uh, last week I was invited 
um, to go to one of these small groups because they had just uh, moved into a new home. So there's two couples, uh, two, a husband and wife, two couples that lead this group. They're older, older men, older women, uh, and they had, they had purchased a new home, and they said, hey, we're gonna, we're, it's our first night in our new home. Would you mind coming by to kind of like dedicate the home and dedicate the group? And um, I'd never done that before, but I said yes anyway, even though I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, I just kind of showed up, and it was, it was great. There were about 20-something uh, of these young adults, and... Um, they had made dinner for them, and so there are just all these kind of young adults just hanging out, eating dinner, and I'm, I'm standing in the, in the kitchen um, with the guy who, who had just purchased the home. I said, this is so cool. This is so great. I love, I love this, and uh, I said, by the way, congratulations on the new home. It's, it's beautiful, and he goes, yeah, you know, it's a um, funny story. So my wife and I, and our kids are grown and kind of had moved out, and we were living in this house. I was about 1,300 square feet, and, um, you know, it was just me and her, and it was, it was great. It was perfect. Um, but then we had started to serve in 710, and we started this redemption community. We started this small group, and uh, the group just started to grow and grow and grow, and we said, we got to get a bigger house so that we can have this small group. Now, listen, that, I'm not saying y'all got to go out and buy a new house, but Come on, I love that. And I'm just like, that is the heart behind what it is to invest and to serve and to give your life for the next generation. I am so thankful for the Caleb's in this church, men who won't give up, men who won't give up on me, and men who will not give up on the promises of God. Verse three, women, you're up. Older women, Likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. Reverent in behavior means that you fear God, and it means you have a, a reverence for God, and that shows up in your behavior. It means you're not a slanderer, you're not a gossip, you don't talk negatively behind other people's backs, right? This is kind of a sneaky thing in church, right? We've got a piece of gossip, but we dress it up like, hey, let me just bounce this idea off of you, or this thought, or can I share this prayer request with you, right? But you're really just trying to slander another person, Paul says, teach them not to do that. Teach them not to be slaves to much wine. In other words, live in moderation. Teach what accords with truth about Jesus. You see, younger women in our culture, they're praised for their physical beauty, and there's a lot of pressure on them to maintain that beauty no matter what the cost is. And our culture doesn't find a lot of value in age unless you're able to keep the physical beauty of your youth going. But there's a beauty that older women possess that most younger women don't or don't invest in. Character is a precious and unsung beauty. And the women who grow in their beauty in their older age, they, they grow in their beauty because the quality of their character begins to shine through. And character is one of those things that just doesn't happen. It comes by cultivating a love for Jesus and his gospel. It comes by guarding your mouth. It comes by not slandering, not gossiping. It comes through not serving your own desires and appetites all the time. It comes through living a life of moderation. And that development of character over years is what gives you ability and platform to teach what is good because it's in you. It's proven. It just comes out of you. That phrase, teaching what is good, it, it means showing others what is beautiful. And Paul is saying, look, in a healthy church, women teaching or women literally walking alongside younger women is essential and it's important. And he affirms them here. He knows how important women are in the church and he encourages them in living out the gospel by making their life available to younger women. In Romans chapter 1 verse 11, Paul says this, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Verse 12, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Here's what Paul's saying there and here. He's saying, look, I want to be with you so that I can strengthen you. And, and I want to be with you because I'm going to be encouraged by you. There's mutual encouragement that's happening. I'm going to give my life and walk alongside your life, and I'll be encouraged by that. You'll be strengthened by the things that I've learned about God and even the th places where I've failed in life. There's mutual encouragement that happens. I'm going to open my life up to you. We grow together. There, there are older women in this congregation who have invested heavily in my wife, and those relationships are absolutely priceless to her, and they're priceless to me as well, because they have helped her to navigate her relationship with me, her relationship with Jesus, her relationship with our, with our kids in a way that I could not. 
We moved here, it'll be nine years this year actually, um, when Lauren and I moved here from, from Florida. And when we showed up, it was just two of us, no kids. Now we've got three kids, family has grown, all kinds of stuff. But we left, all of our family, all of our family lives on the East Coast. And if it were not for these men and for these women that I've talked about this morning, who have invested in, who have loved, have cared, have served, essentially adopted us, I cannot say for sure that we would still be here. These relationships are so important. God knows that. Paul knows that. That's why he gives instructions on them. Look at verse 4 and 5. He continues, uh, And so train the young women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled or attacked. All right, so there's a couple words in there. Working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands. This is where we pump the brakes on passages like this. But let's put something out there right away. So Paul is not teaching about male dominance. Teach them to be busy at home does not mean that young women are not to work outside the home. There's multiple places in the scripture um, where we see examples of women who work outside of the home and they're affirmed. There's Lydia, the seller of purple. There's a gang of women that follows Jesus that supports his ministry. The ideal woman in Proverbs 31 works outside the home. In this particular culture here, the wife was the family manager, which meant that all the household activity and also the family business were run by her. So this modern American idea that we have of a stay-at-home mom didn't really exist in this culture, so Paul wouldn't have addressed it like that. So Paul's not saying that they are never to work outside the home. It just means that there is a tendency for young women and young men, for that matter, to be lured away from God-given responsibilities by the false promise of fulfillment elsewhere. There is no denying that God has given a particular role to a mother and a particular responsibility in the home that only she can play. And, and, and a lot of times this requires sacrifice of other things that she could do to fulfill them. But a lot of times uh, she can't give as much to her career or maybe she has to give that up altogether. And when, a lot of times when that happens, there is a feeling of a sense of loss. But what God in the gospel calls us to is not self-fulfillment, but self-sacrifice and to embrace it joyfully. As followers of Jesus, we find our fulfillment in service to King Jesus and to others. Now, this is one of those places where worldly values and kingdom values could not be further apart because the world promotes this type of thinking that if if you are a homemaker, then you are living a lesser life. And then unless you fulfill your desires and your ambition and your goal, then you're selling yourself short. But we've seen time and time again what happens when you live like that. When you live only for your own goals, your own ambitions, then people become annoyances that need to be managed to you. Your your, your kids are now accessories that you got to find a place for rather than people that you give your life for. Your spouse now becomes disposable. Your relationships and friendships, you use them for what they can do for you, for your own agenda. In short, you end up using people, not loving people, not laying your life down for them. And, and you know what? We really as families need to evaluate what really matters for us because we want this lifestyle. We want these comforts. And those things are earned by long hours at work away from the home. But we also want the quality family time that happens when everybody's home. And then we fill in all of our margins and spaces with hobbies or activities or expectations that we put on the kids and on our family. It is no wonder that we are the most stressed out generation ever. We're trying to have all these things, and you cannot live according to the simplicity of the gospel and the comparison trap of being compared to other people and what other people have at the same time. You can't do it. You have to choose um, which way you're going to live. We see Jesus in the scripture. He finds fulfillment in washing feet because that's what his father told him to do. He did not find his fulfillment in the importance of the task or by achieving his potential. He found his fulfillment in the approval of his father. And Christians, we find our fulfillment and satisfaction in our faithfulness, not in our accomplishments. This this church, like so many churches, is full of smart, educated, capable, high-capacity women, many of whom serve the good of society and our communities in excellent ways outside of the home. And I know that those same types of women serve primarily inside the home, and I think both are affirmed in the scriptures. And if for a time in your life God has assigned you to care for children and establish a home, find your fulfillment in knowing that you have been a faithful servant for the fame of Jesus, not the praise of the world. 
The, the ultimate fulfillment for a Jesus follower comes from hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, now dads, we've got a lot to learn here too. I, I have a lot to learn. I'm learning this currently because there are things in my life that I need to set aside or say no to for the benefit and good of my family and children. And, and again, this is where those men have, have been so key in my life to help me evaluate my time outside of the home and away from the family. And maybe that's something that you need to do if you're a young dad in here. You need to do a personal assessment of the time that you spend outside of the family. But, and, and, and here's why I've learned this has been so important, because I only have one season as a dad with younger kids. And I know, I know it's tough, too. I know the grind. I mean, there are some days where I'm just absolutely spent, cashed out. I just want to go and crash. I just want to get on the couch. And I go through the door, and then I hear these three little voices. Dad, let's wrestle. I was like, ugh. <laughs> that and when my wife tells me that we've got a toddler's birthday party on a Saturday morning during college football season. <laughs> just stop doing that to us, please. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. I, w- I, would not, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it. One, because I love my kids. They're a gift from God. But two, because one day I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I, I, I want to he- hear, look, I gave you the opportunity to be a husband and dad, and you certainly weren't perfect, but you laid your life down the way that I laid my life down for you. I want to hear that one day. Whatever role God has given you, whether it's the opportunity to work outside the home or the opportunity to stay at home, don't be disgruntled with that role. You see, Paul's not addressing where you work. He's talking about how you work because there's plenty of stay-at-home moms that neglect their family and have disdain for where God has them. And I know a lot of women who work outside the home and excel in both arenas because they understand the importance of being faithful to what and to who God has given them. You see, God does not commend our tasks or our accomplishment. He commends our faithfulness, 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Okay, as if that wasn't enough, Paul goes on to say, urge younger women to be subject to their husbands. Now, Paul is not teaching male dominance, male superiority. In fact, we see other teachings of Paul where marriage is this mutual submission. Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is how you show love, mutual submission. Submitting means that you make the decision to place your own desires and your own needs under the needs and desires of the other. And Paul says the motivation for that type of submission is found in your reverence for Christ. So in your marriage, be saturated in, be captivated with what Jesus Christ has done for you, what he has done on your behalf. And the more, the closer you get to that, the more you're submitting to one another becomes a joy, not a burden. Marriage is this beautiful dance in which both partners reenact and reflect the gospel. The the husband does it by loving his wife like Christ loved the church, which means he puts her wants and needs ahead of his own. He lays down his life for her. The wife does it by submitting to the will and leading of the husband. My role as a husband is never about me dominating my wife. In fact, if I'm loving my wife like Christ loved the church, I will always be putting her needs and preferences above my own. My leadership is to be humble and always for the good of my wife, not myself, so that my role in marriage is a blessing to her and not a burden. And what it means for my wife is that she would yield to the decision-making responsibility that God has put on me. And as she follows me, she knows ultimately I'm following God. I'm trusting God in this. There's a pastor named Matt Chandler. He says, a husband sacrificially loving his wife and a wife submitted to her godly husband creates a relationship that the world would never look at and say, that's disgusting and archaic. A lot of the people who are turned off by the Christian teaching on headship and marriage are attracted to the Christian marriages that they see. And you got to understand contextually too, this would have been a very powerful teaching in this culture at this time because most of the marriages were arranged marriages and most of these women were about 13 years old. And so Paul says, this is how you love one another. This is how you reflect the gospel in your marriages. Look at verse six. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. It's interesting that the only word of exhortation given to young men is just be self-controlled. The women get like seven things and Paul's just like, just tell those guys to be chill. Please just get a handle on it, guys. 
I, I work primarily with, with younger guys, kind of in, in that age stage, and if I had to boil down my, my counsel with them, my interactions with them, it would come down to this issue. Because they're ruled by their desires, they're ruled by their appetites. Proverbs 25, 28 says, a man without self-control is like a city whose walls have been broken through. Now think of the imagery there. A, a wall would be used to keep out wild animals, attackers, thieves, criminals. But, and the Bible says, without self-control, you're like a city without a wall. And an enemy can just walk in anytime because he knows that you've never managed or never said no to your appetites and desires. An enemy can come in anytime and kill and steal and destroy. J.C. Ryle says, being ruled by the desires of your body will murder your soul. Young men are notorious. They trade the immediate thing, the thing that their body wants now, for the ultimate thing that God has prepared for you later. He, he gives these instructions to Titus then uh, as a model in verse, in verse 7. He says, show yourself, Titus, in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say to us. He says, okay, Titus, I need you to set this example now of what young men are to be about. And here's what they're to be about. Model good works, humble service, grind it out, serve, integrity, stability. Another, another way to say integrity is make your life make sense. If you say one thing about your life, make it match up. Make your life make sense. Sound speech, healthy speech. Put away foolish talk. Put away foolish talk. Say things that are encouraging. Say things that are true. Say things that bring exhortation, right? Say, say, say the strong, say the healthy thing. In short, what, what he's saying is, look, look, young men, you need to grow up. The time for being irresponsible and living for yourself, the time is over. It's, it's time to start living out the biblical picture of what it is to be a godly man. Now, again, how do we do all of this stuff? Verse 11 is so key because it's by the grace of God. Otherwise, we'll just take this list and we'll think, oh, man, great Sunday morning, another list of things I got to start doing. It's by the grace of God. That's what teaches you to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust. When you have fantasies, young men, about a, a woman's body, uh, Paul says, think about the body of Jesus that was beaten and torn apart for you. Replace those images with the image of Jesus who bled for you so that you could be free from lust. As you start to say yes to the grace of God, you'll learn to say no to the desires of the flesh. Paul ends this section talking to bondservants. He says in verse 9, slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They're to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in, that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. No, Titus was to teach these bond servants about the specific duties as, as Christians. You've got to understand, too, in this culture, it was already pretty radical for these churches to have slaves and masters in the same context together. And a lot of times, these slaves would be elders over their masters and overseers over their masters in the context of the church. Spurgeon has a commentary on this. I think that's really helpful. He says, uh, do not think for a moment Paul believed that the practice of slavery ought to exist. He believed to the fullest extent that the great principles of Christianity would over, overthrow slavery anywhere, and the sooner they did, so the better pleased would he be. But for the time being, as it was the custom to have slaves, they must adorn the doctrine of God their Savior in the position in which they were. So Paul is not condoning colonial slavery. He's uh, uh, talking to the working class here, and he says, your, your work should put your hope and your love for God in display. A Christian should have an entirely different attitude in the workplace. We talked about this last month. But, but this means that a Christian works with integrity. It, it means you, you don't steal. You, you, you don't pilfer because you know that God sees. They work with excellence. You're not just doing the bare minimum. You're trying to work in a way that actually blesses your employer and blesses your fellow employees and blesses the people that you work for. You, you work as a, as a servant. Your, your work is an act of service for the good of other people. For You're always seeking the common good with your work. And, and you work with hope. You're, you're showing all good faith. It, what, what Paul's saying here, look, teach them to work in a way. Their identity does not come from your work. Your identity as a Christian does not come from your work. It comes from God. What you do does not define you, but what has been done on your behalf defines you. When your identity is found in God, you won't feel the need to cheat or to steal at work. You won't need, feel the need to cut corners uh, or lie to gain an advantage because you entrust your life and your future to your heavenly father. 
And when we lose sight of the gospel, our job does become our identity, doesn't it? Have you ever, you know, kind of talked to somebody about what you do and you make up like a fancy title so they think your job is really better than, than what it is? Just me? Okay. Um, one time, Aaron, my friend, he works in the sound booth back there. He's on our production staff. Uh, and, and Aaron and I were playing golf with this older guy. And uh, it was just the two of us and, and this guy had been matched up. And, and he started to ask us. He's like, well, so what do you guys what do you guys do? And Aaron says, well, I, I'm, I work in video production at this church down the road. And the guy's like, oh, okay, that's cool. That's a, that's a good job. And then he asked me, what do you do? And I said, I'm a pastor to 20-somethings. And when I said 20-somethings, I was describing the age stage that I pastor. So people kind of in their 20s, 20-somethings. But he thought I meant the amount of people that I pastor. Like, I pastor 20-something people, to which he replied, well, that's not very many people. And I was like, no, it's not. Um, but that was really good. God knew that I needed that that day, so that was good. As if golf isn't humiliating enough, but that was, that was really good. But here's what the gospel teaches us about. Here's what the gospel teaches us about our job titles. It teaches us that we will never have a job title that's greater than the title that Jesus has spoken over you. And that title that Jesus gives us is not a title that we have earned anyway, that we, would, that we would boast in it. So all we do is we just humbly say thank you and we celebrate the one who has given us that title. And when we live like this, when we work like this, when we invest in others like this, verse 10 happens, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. The word adorn is dress up in the gospel. I've got two little girls, ages five and six, and um, they love to play dress up, right? And so they'll come out of their room and they're dressed up uh, as Anna or Elsa or Belle. These are all Disney princesses, by the way, if you're not swimming in that stream currently. And, and, uh, and, and Cinderella, when they come out dressed like that, I, they, I have to address them as that particular character. And they talk like that character. And they reenact the things that those characters have done. They dress up in a new identity. And what Paul's saying, look, if you conduct yourself with purity and grace and hope, um, you're going to have opportunities to talk about this new identity. That's what 1 Peter 3.15 is all about. Give them a reason to ask about the hope that is inside you. Adorn the gospel. Get dressed up in good news. Get dressed up in good news. Display the beauty of who Jesus is in everything that you do and in every relationship that you have. Okay, quickly, a couple takeaways and then we're done here. Um, the, the, first, the first kind of so what is the behaviors in this passage are our best witness. Tim Chester is an author, and he says this, people may not like it when we talk about self-control and submission, but they find it attractive when we live it. Unbelievers who are repelled by the Christian teaching on headship within marriage are attracted by the Christian marriages they see. Unbelievers who find Christian morality restrictive are attracted by the good lives of the Christians that they know. Things like integrity, excellence, generosity, love, those are winsome things. Those are things that make Jesus known in the world. The second thing is that the gospel is revealed and experienced in the mundane. Paul is talking to Titus here about just everyday relationships, everyday activities, because that's where your Christianity is best measured. If you want to take your spiritual temperature, you want to measure the health of your faith, don't measure it with what you do in here in this room on a Sunday. Don't measure it at your summer camp or on your missions trip. Measure it in your home. Measure it in your neighborhood. Measure it at your work. Measure it in your relationships with your spouse, with your kids. That's where your health of your faith is tested. A true hypocrite is a, is a person who is a Christian everywhere except in their own home. And these ordinary places, these ordinary relationships, those are the places where God most shows up in extraordinary ways. And then finally, and it's so important that we get this, but these behaviors flow out of the gospel they flow out of the good news of who Jesus is. The, the, the list that Paul makes here, these are not necessarily new things. They are natural byproducts of a heart that's captivated by Jesus Christ. And when we grow deeper in our adoration of who he is and what he has done and his promises towards his children, these behaviors, they grow in our hearts and they grow in our lives. Let's pray and ask that God would do that this week. Father God, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the way that it challenges us. God, I thank you for the way that it sharpens us. God, I thank you for um, the conviction that happens when we open your word. And God, I thank you for your kindness that leads us to a repentance. God, a new way of living. Um, God, I thank you that there is a new way of living.
God, I thank you that you provide for us uh, instruction like this. And, and God, I just pray this week um, that whether it's older man or older woman or younger man or younger woman, um, God, we would be reminded of your favor. We'd be reminded of your amazing grace. We'd be reminded of the work that Jesus has done on our behalf. And we'd be reminded of the title that you have put over us. Would we rest in it? Would we celebrate it? Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.